Welcome to the Voice of Russia in Washington, D.C. I'm Rob Sachs. Time now for our weekly international panel discussion, where we link up with our studios in London and Moscow. Today's topic is the peace talks between Israelis and Palestinians, which relaunched this week in Washington after a three-year hiatus. All the major issues of settlements, borders, right of return, and the status of Jerusalem remain on the table. The question remains now, is there political will for both sides to broker some type of agreement? And what diplomatic tools does John Kerry and the current U.S. administration bring to the table to break the impasse when so many have failed before? At least the optics are looking positive. Photographers snap pictures of Kerry with his arms around Israeli Justice Minister Zippy Livni and Palestinian Chief Negotiator Saib Erekat. At a press conference, Livni sounded optimistic. It is our task to work together so that we can transform that spark of hope into something real and lasting. Well, joining us for this discussion here in our Washington, D.C. studio is Ambassador Philip Wilcox. He is president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. That's a D.C.-based group devoted to fostering peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Ambassador Wilcox retired from the U.S. Foreign Service in September of 97 after 31 years of service. In Moscow, we're joined by Nikolai Surkov. He's Assistant Professor of Foreign Relations at the Moscow State Institute. He's also the Middle East expert at Russian Beyond the Headlines. And in London, we're joined by Ian Dunt. He is an editor at politics.co.uk. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ambassador Wilcox, let's begin with you. Um, we have seen many different iterations of talks over the years. Um, and yet, as I mentioned, a lot of the same basic issues remain. Uh, but if you could go over real briefly, what are the key sticking points that have to be hashed out? There's, there's a lot on the table. Uh, Rob, thank you for the uh, opportunity to talk. There is uh, a real challenge here uh, to resolve this historic conflict between Israel and Palestine. And the only real resolution can come through a genuine a two-state peace agreement. All of those final status issues that you mentioned are unresolved. Jerusalem, borders, settlements, uh, refugees, uh, and, and a fifth one, uh, security. Uh, the format that has been used in the past has been bilateral negotiations. The fact that 20 years of bilateral negotiations have failed should be a lesson to all the negotiators that something more is needed, a new format. Otherwise, uh, given the failures of the past, uh, they're likely to repeat themselves. And Ian Dunt, what format do you think could work when so many in the past have failed? I'm, I've got to say, I'm not entirely sure that the format makes an enormous amount of difference. Usually this is about uh, various complicated factors, not least of all domestic politics. And of course, the broader Middle East situation, I mean, I, I'm actually not quite as optimistic as, as I think the tone suggested a moment ago. I think really the reason that America is pushing towards having these discussions now says more about how intractable the problems are in Syria and in Egypt than it does about there being any real sense of optimism about what can be achieved in Israel-Palestine. Uh, I want to get you to respond to that. Uh, before we go to Nikolai Surkov, Ambassador Wilcox, is this timing you know, connected to U.S. ambitions elsewhere in the Middle East, or is it genuine in trying to say, OK, let's try to relaunch this? Are, are there other things that uh, the U.S. is calculating in timing these specific talks? I think uh, notwithstanding the unstable and confused situation throughout the Arab world, uh, this opportunity uh, is more open to solution for the United States, or at least it's more susceptible to U.S. influence because of the very close uh, intimate relationship between the United States and the State of Israel. Uh, I think that is uh, one of the reasons why the Secretary of State and the President have decided that the U.S. Could be, should be committed to a return to negotiations. Uh, 
I think there's also a sense of the growing strategic danger of this conflict, not only to the Israelis and the Palestinians, but to the United States. Uh, and so that, I think, is the setting uh, for this return to negotiations. I don't mean to say that there is much optimism about success because of the repeated failures in the past and the apparent intractability of this uh, deep-seated conflict is going to be very, very difficult. That's why I said that a new format is needed, and in my view, the change should be a more assertive um, and active role for the United States, not just as a, a message passer, but as a mediator. Well, I want to play two clips that we heard from Arakat and also from Livni before the talks began. Let's first listen to Arakat. It's time for the Palestinians to live in peace, freedom, and dignity within their own independent sovereign state. And here is Livni. We came here today from a troubled and changing region. We are hopeful, but we cannot be naive. We cannot afford it in our region. Uh, Nikolai Surkov, you play those two clips back to back, and there's a lot of similarities, but also it sounds like in between the lines there, you can almost sense, though, that there is a lot on the table for both sides, that there are these deep uh, feelings about not uh, wanting to return, uh, you know, coming out, I don't know, losing in this, in this negotiation because of all these bitter feelings that have been going on for decades now. Um, what's at stake for these negotiators? Do they have the latitude to actually broker something, or are the people that, you know, that they are representing so entrenched that uh, there's really not much room for them to negotiate? Well, I see three positive points. First of all, the Israeli public opinion might be ready to accept a peace solution because of the previous conflict in Gaza, which showed that the Palestinians can be a real threat to Israel, even, even with Israeli military superiority. Secondly, we have Tsipi Livni, who runs the negotiations for the Israeli part. And this is also important, since Tsipi Livni was part of Ehud Olmert's team. And as far as I know, Ehud Olmert was on the verge of reaching a peace agreement with the Palestinians. And we also have to keep in mind that now Israel is really surrounded by a very dangerous, uh, uh, by a very dangerous uh, situation in the region. So Netanyahu has uh, at least one reason to get a peace negotiate uh, to get a peace agreement with the Palestinians in order to be out of the Middle East crisis equation. At least he wants peace with the Arab world. He wants peace with the Palestinians in order not to think about this problem, because now Israel has much more problems uh, considering Syria, Lebanon, Egypt. So at least they need a deal with the Palestinians, though I'm still not sure that all the, the Israeli population is ready to accept a peace deal, which will definitely need m great concessions on the Israeli part. Ian Dunt, what's your take on that? Are the conditions ripe now for some type of breakthrough because of the pressures that have occurred through all the unrest surrounding Israel? No, not really. Um, well, first of all, if you take the Palestinian side, uh, there's almost no optimism about what is happening right now among the Palestinian population. And actually what that does is it reduces the incentives for the Palestinian negotiating team to go out on a limb because they stand to gain to a bigger part and they stand to lose nothing politically by walking away uh, from these talks. On the Israeli side, uh, it's true what the gentleman earlier was saying, that um, there is some small change in, in Israeli public opinion. However, the government itself, this coalition, is extremely militant. It's an extremely uh, nationalistic, uh, religious um, government, uh, which, which won't really, I mean, it's, it's, it's outraged that talks are even going on right now, let alone if something was to actually come from them. There is one wrinkle to that, however, and that's that actually the Orthodox Jewish parties have been ejected from the coalition.
and are actually domestically under quite a lot of criticism. One of the things that binds the current coalition is this drive to make um, Orthodox Jews do military service, to cut some of the state uh, spending that goes their way. And in response, there's been some quite interesting political manoeuvring from them. They're starting to suggest that they might actually have a much more critical attitude towards the more hawkish elements um, um, in the Israeli politics. So in the long run, it's possible, you know, when they become kingmakers at a future election, and they will, they've got about 20 seats, so they inevitably will be kingmakers once again, that they will actually have a much more critical view of, say, the settlement process than they have done historically. So there's potential there, but at the moment, there, there's very few reasons to be optimistic. Ambassador Wilcox, you served in Jerusalem, saw things from all different sides. How much does the makeup of the Knesset really drive uh, where the peace talks are going? And could we see the influx of the Orthodox, uh, you know, voice really change the dynamic and, and force Netanyahu to take maybe a different stance than he has in the past? The Knesset, as Mr. Dent pointed out, uh, and the government coalition is probably the most uh, right-wing uh, in history. Uh, the, they are vehemently opposed to a division of the land uh, and the further uh, and it's any cessation to the movement of building Israeli settlements, uh, which has enabled the uh, Israelis and been the main reason and vehicle for their continued occupation. Uh, the party, I think, that is going to be critical in this is not the government coalition, not the ultra-Orthodox community. It's the Israeli public. And repeated polls show that they realize that their state is in genuine danger of losing uh, its character as a Jewish and democratic state. Uh, the, the principal reason for that is that the Palestinian Arab community, both inside Israel and in the occupied territories, will soon, if it has not already happened, become a majority. Uh, that uh, defeats the founding goal of the state of Israel of being a democratic state, unless they were to give the vote to all of the Palestinians, which they will not do because that would eliminate the Zionist state. So um, I think the U.S. must direct its diplomacy not only toward the Israeli government, but toward the Israeli public, which is in deep despair about the future. They too, like the Palestinians, are deeply skeptical about the possibility of peace. But if the U.S. can come up with a formula that is attractive, that is fair, uh, and appealing to the Israeli public and the Palestinian public, there's just a chance that that will move the situation toward a solution and that the current right-wing uh, politics of the Israeli government will be surpassed by a surge of pragmatic uh, liberal public opinion. Well, I want to pose some of those things that you just brought up, Ambassador Wilcox, to Nikolai Surkov, which is this idea of what does it mean to have a Jewish state? Um, and you see the Orthodox, they're having kids by the boatload, uh, dozens at a time, uh, who knows, but um, there is this losing demographic battle, as uh, Ambassador Wilcox was saying, but um, how important is it for um, Israel to maintain a majority of uh, Jews in their population to have that identity? Um, is that a sticking point for going anywhere and making sure that that element is part of uh, what Israel is? Well, I agree with the ambassador that the demographic issue is really on the agenda among the Israeli public. And it is very much discussed in the media, in uh, different mag scientific magazines. It, by, it is discussed by the academics. So, uh, and I agree that really without uh, this, uh, without peace in the near future, the demographic uh, situation in Israel might change greatly because they can't just keep the occupied territories within uh, under their control without taking any steps and thus uh, they there is this danger 
of bringing more and more Palestinians to the Israeli to to the Israeli territories. And besides, you have to think, uh, remember about the refugee issue. While the Israelis are not ready to accept all the refugees, still their Im <coughs> their amount is growing. So the people leaving uh, abroad but still w looking for a chance to come back to Palestine, their numbers are growing. So in case of a peace settlement in the future, then there will be more people who suffer, for example, if the Palestinians decide to uh, refuse uh, to forget about the right of, of the return. So this, is, this issue should be solved from the, from the demographic point as quickly as possible. So the idea of appealing to the public uh, looks uh, very tempting to me. And besides, it's the only real uh, uh, incentive for Netanyahu, who is still very hawkish, but yet he has to listen to the public opinion, which is now more in favor of, of peace Welcome back. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in Washington, D.C. I'm Rob Sachs, and you're listening to our weekly international panel where we link up with our studios in London and Moscow. Today we're talking about the peace talks between Israelis and Palestinians, which relaunched this week in Washington after a three-year hiatus. Here in our Washington, D.C. studios, we're joined by Ambassador Philip Wilcox. He is president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. We're also joined in Moscow by Nikolai Sokov. He is assistant professor of foreign relations at the Moscow State Institute. And in London, our guest is Ian Dunt, editor of politics.co.uk. And Ian Dunt, wanted to talk to you about uh, some of the issues we were talking about before the break and uh, thinking about um, you know what the Palestinians want out of this negotiation we've seen um, you know uh, that uh, there has been a lot of pressure to have more money come to the West Bank uh, to really build up uh, the uh, infrastructure there how much could uh, they see in terms of improvement from uh, the international community giving aid if they were able to successfully broker some type of deal? I mean, I think that pales in comparison, frankly, to the potential for actually getting, you know, final status talks. I mean, Palestinians cannot wait much longer before getting a state or there will be no state for them to have. I mean, if, even if you look at the map now, it looks like a Pollock painting. You can barely tell what's Palestine and what's a settlement, you know, or potentially Palestine. They know that time is running out. I mean, some, you know, th there are some pretty, pretty expert figures who already think it may be too late to try and establish a contiguous um, Palestinian state. Um, and that's not an entirely unreasonable position to hold. So far more important, I think, than funding it has to be the 67 borders and it has to be a freeze on settlements. I mean, those are, you know, this is final state stuff. It's very unlikely that you would get it. I mean, you know, the settlement thing would absolutely drive <laughs> the Israeli parliament completely nuts. It's very hard to imagine how it would take place. But nevertheless, that is what the Palestinians need far more so than they need aid or any other change by infrastructure um, international organizations. Ambassador Wilcox. Ambassador Wilcox, when you talk about the 67 borders and the settlements, this is an area where the U.S. and Israel have um, not necessarily seen eye to eye. Uh, you had President Obama saying that the 67 borders should be a precondition to talks, whereas uh, Israelis were saying, no, that is an, uh, an important bargaining chip that we need to have before we go into discussions, or you know, as we're in discussions, not as a precursor. And then with the settlements, um, you also have Benjamin Netanyahu saying, this is our land, we can settle it, and uh, it's gotten a reproach from the Obama administration. So do you think that this is something, these two particular issues are ones that, um, they can hash out in any reasonable way? Well, I think the fundamental issue is the settlements, uh, the settlements which have, have driven as the occupation. Uh, I don't think that there will be agreement uh, for uh, starting the conversation on the basis of the 67 borders. But the 67 borders, of course, will be right at the heart of the occupation because it's of the cons discussion, the negotiations, because uh, if something approximating a Palestinian state along the 67 borders with uh, land swaps that are acceptable to both sides is not accomplished, then there'll be no peace. 
and the conflict will continue. Um, <clears throat> the, you asked me a second question. Could you remind me what it was? Well, just in thinking about uh, the 67 borders uh, as a precondition yeah. versus, uh, you know, something that can be negotiated, because sure. I've heard from the Israeli side, well, you know, there may be land swaps, but not necessarily along those lines, and that we want to have the flexibility of picking which parts we want to swap and not necessarily saying it has to be this or that. Well, <clears throat> the actual border that will bring... Uh, the creation of a Palestinian state will have to be negotiated. Uh, of course, the Israelis will press for the retention of uh, as many settlements and as much land in the West Bank and East Jerusalem as they can get. Uh, the Palestinians will not be uh, generous in this negotiation because they know that they can't have a viable state unless the majority of the settlements are evacuated. They will yield on some of the very big settlements along the 67 border uh, and agree to the annexation of those settlements by Israel, but only in return for Israel's willingness to give Israeli land of comparable size and quality to the Palestinians. Now, the hardest issue of all is Jerusalem, and the Israelis have uh, de facto annexed a vast area around East Jerusalem, knowing that East Jerusalem, uh, there will no, be no peace, uh, no end to settlement unless there is a so solution to the Jerusalem dilemma. The Palestinians insist on having their capital in East Jerusalem. They will not yield on that. Well, Nikolai Sarkov, uh, when you talk about Jerusalem, um, is having Jerusalem being a shared capital, something that uh, you think is a possibility. Um, you know, you, you see it already divided now, East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem now, but uh, having, you know, you, you have uh, the uh, U.S. Embassy is not even in Jerusalem now because it's not recognized by the United States as the capital of Israel. But, you know, is this something where you think there could be real movement? Well, there can be a real movement. Uh, Yes, but w the problem is the political will, whether there is enough of political will or not. Because even when I was a student, I went to, uh, to Israel for a diplomatic internship, and there I saw actual maps, plans of how Jerusalem can be divided between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And these plans were devoted by people uh, who arranged unofficial negotiations. So I suppose that now what is really necessary is the principal decision to share this city and to live in peace. Without it, well, nothing can be done. But technically, these issues can be solved if both parties are inclined to have an, a settlement. And, well, there will be, of course, a huge, a very serious discussion on the status of the Temple Mount, which is, I think, the heart of the problem. But still, I think, if there is political will, this problem can be overcome. Well, we have an example of uh, the Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty when, Beg uh, when Beg Menahem Begin was ready to do very serious, con to accept very serious concessions in order to achieve peace, and he was a very right-wing person. So, all we need is political will. Technically, all things can be arranged. I Ian Dunt, I want to get your opinion on that. Um, uh, we heard uh, Nikolai Surkov mention the word sharing, and it doesn't seem like Israelis and Palestinians want to share anything. Uh, there are huge security barriers demarcating the Israeli side versus the Palestinian side. Is there any chance that there could be a shared territory in Jerusalem, or is it going to have to be more walls? You certainly start with walls in the same, it's exactly the same thing that happened in Northern Ireland, of course. And now, you know, eventually you start trying to bring the walls down, but that, that does take time and you do start with walls. You always, I mean, this kind of discussion is a very um, sort of sober discussion. It's not necessarily the way that these discussions take place in the Middle East. I mean, obviously the famous quote you know, from, from the Israeli writer, I forget his name, is, we can, we can solve it if it's a question of real estate. <laughs> 
If it's a real estate question, it's solvable. If it's bigger than that, if it's religious, if it's spiritual, then it becomes something where there's considerably more heat than light. Um, and it becomes a, rather a more problematic situation for people to solve. Um, so as long as the debates are conducted in the manner in which we're talking about them right now, which is looking at possible practical solutions, which is looking at areas, how could you demarcate it, how could you share it, then there's more of a chance. Unfortunately, we don't know, of course, those are secret talks. Um, but the, the likelihood is that that is not entirely the emotional way in which these debates are being conducted behind closed doors. Also wanted to ask you, Ian, about uh, Hamas and what's going on in the Gaza Strip. We saw earlier uh, when uh, there were rocket attacks, Iron Dome effectively stopped many of them. Um, and uh, now that you have Morsi leaving power in Egypt and Iran cutting off funding, that Hamas has been weakened. Um, where do they enter into all this? Are they just kind of looking at these talks saying, I, I hope uh, we're a part of this too, or are, are they not even yet at the table? They're not at the table at all. And actually, if there is a glimmer of, of hope, of reason for optimism, it's that the, the Hamas wild card could potentially be quite interesting. As you say, they are weakened, um, not least of all by the ejection of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Um, and they are quite distracted, of course, by the extraordinary series of events that we're seeing across the region. If you were to say that Israel was to come forward with something approximating the 67 borders or you know, something like it, something that had roughly the same quality and a freeze on settlements, it's possible that the Palestinian, I mean, this is blue sky stuff, but it's possible that the Palestinian authorities would be able to say, look, we'll give you Hamas on a plate. You know, as well as the fact that, you know, we, we will cease our unilateral attempt to get recognition through the UN. Can he provide Hamas on a plate? Now, that's another question, but it's certainly true that Fatah has never been closer to being able to provide such a thing as it is at this moment. So if there's any hope, it's in that wild card situation right there. But I should stress, again, it's a glimmer of hope, not a ray. Ambassador Wilcox, what's your take? How much influence does Fatah have over Hamas at this point in time? Well, the two are deeply divided, and I think the the leadership of the two factions uh, thus far have been more, more interested in maintaining their uh, rather pathetic little uh, fiefdoms than looking at the larger uh, future of Palestine and agreeing to reconcile over their, their differences. Uh, and I don't think that's going to change until there is hope for the Palestinian people uh, in a real peace solution and two genuine states living side by side. Uh, would it be then three? Or would you have, um, you know, West Bank being a state and the Gaza being a state? How, how would that all work out with them being so far divided? It's inconceivable. Uh, they, uh, their deep family uh, political ties, historical ties between the Gazans and the West Bankers. Uh, the the chances for reconciliation are very slim, however, unless uh, they have something to look forward to in the form of a real Palestinian state. <clears throat> Hamas will not stand in the way of that uh, if that possibility emerges, because uh, no Palestinian political faction could stand in the way of a real peace uh, if it becomes a realistic prospect. Well, in talking about the prospects of peace, we have uh, these talks here in Washington, D.C., but we've seen um, everyone from uh, former Prime Minister Tony Blair go down there, make it his mission to try to broker peace, and then you have the quartet where you have Russia involved as well. And Nikolai Surkov, want to ask you from the Russian perspective, what kind of international influence and who is the right broker for peace? Is it the quartet? Is it the United States? Is it uh, someone like a Tony Blair camping out there and saying, I'm going to stay here until we can get it done? H how do you have the, the right amount of pressure? Because so many have failed in the past. Well, uh, if we want to be realistic, then the best broker in the current situation is the United States. Uh, well, because uh, the United States has the most influence on Israel, and now in the current situation, it's the Israel. Uh, Israel is the party which will have to make the most concessions. 
And on the other hand, uh, Tony Blair and the Quartet and Russia, what they can do is to facilitate the process, well, to ease some tensions, but the real uh, the real uh, agreement must be brokered by the United States, which have the, the positions to influence Israel, and they can guarantee this agreement later if it's really achieved. Ian Dunt, we've heard so much over the years, the roadmap for peace, uh, you know, deadlines, uh, you know, trying to figure out, okay, well, we're going to do this by this point, and here's going to be a, a milestone that we're going to try to reach by this point in time. And already we're hearing that uh, with these talks, hopefully something will be happening in nine months. That's what we've heard from John Kerry. Uh, how uh, crazy is it to have these kinds of um, dates set in the future for trying to hit achievements? Is that is that a good thing to say, let's, let's put a deadline on it, or is that um, putting unnecessary pressure on these talks? I... Uh, no, I, I think it would have been unwise to not put any deadline at all because then you lose all political will. Um, actually, John Kerry's played the whole thing pretty cannily altogether. He got a little bit, possibly a little bit overexcited with this sort of final state talk. I mean, he was noticeably, when, when they came, the three of them, along with Livni and Ukraine, to do their sort of joint press conference, he seemed noticeably more excitable. He seemed much more upbeat than either the Israeli or the Palestinian negotiating teams. Um, but I thought it was completely valid for him to say nine months, um, even if possibly he got a little overexcited with, with some of the other things he said. Uh, he's, he's played a bit of a blinder. I don't think anybody really thought that he would get us to this stage in the six months of rather frantic behind-the-scenes shuttle diplomacy that he's been doing. Um, but he has, so he's earned himself a little bit of leeway on these kind of mistakes. And what are you going to be looking for as they hash things out? What's going to be a sign for you that, wait a second, something has changed and this is a significant step forward? You know what will be great is if in seven or eight months' time, we've still heard absolutely nothing from the negotiating room. Because they start talking to the press, they start leaking, when frankly, they're not dealing with anything substantive. The fact that actually we've got almost no information of what went on in that room is a pretty good sign. It does suggest that there's a chance, at least a chance, that they were actually dealing with major substantive issues. That they weren't just saying, OK, let's leave, for instance, right of return until the end, when it will inevitably clog up anything else that you've talked about. There's a chance that that means that they were addressing these issues from the start. And that would be an extremely promising development. I wouldn't look for any more than that. We have about 30 seconds left, but Ambassador Wilcox, what are you going to be looking for? Well, Ian has suggested that these negotiations can succeed if they're conducted uh, in uh, absolute secrecy without leaks. I must say I disagree. I think that uh, what hangs in the balance here is public opinion. And unless the Israeli public can be mobilized on behalf of making these major changes and sacrifices, uh, and to insist that their government abandon this policy of settlements and occupation, I don't think anything is going to happen. So the negotiating process in part must be uh, confidential, but there has to be an effort to mobilize public opinion in the state of Israel and Palestine to overcome this despair and get them to force their own governments uh, to change their intransigence and agree to a, a reasonable well, settlement. We're going to have to leave it there. That's Ambassador Philip Wilcox. He is president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. We're also joined by Nikolai Surkov, assistant professor of foreign relations at the Moscow State Institute. And in London, Ian Dunt, editor of politics.co.uk. Thank you all so much for this discussion.